Good morning. Today is the fourth Sunday of Pentecost. Pentecost is a long, long time, and sometimes churches call this ordinary time. That makes me think of ho-hum. However, I wonder how often church just feels sort of ordinary and not at all like the fire and wind of Pentecost. I hope when you come, you do feel a bit of fire and wind and that there's nothing ordinary about our God. This time is also sometimes called proper time, and that's a better word. It's proper for us to worship. That's what I hope. Today, I greet you with these words sort of taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. These words are from the message. Thank God that each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Those words are lovely. We can live grace-filled in a light-filled life because of God. This very God, you are here to worship today, to worship our anything but ordinary God in a proper way. Let's do that. Listen now to this call to worship taken from Psalm 86. You'll be hearing more about that soon. Incline your ear, O God, and hear the praises of your people. Gladden the hearts of your servants as we lift up our souls to you. For you, O God, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. In the day of trouble we call on you, knowing you will answer. Your people everywhere glorify your name, for you are slow to anger and abound in steadfast love. Turn to us and be gracious, God of us all. Our opening hymn this morning is sort of taken from the Romans reading <clears throat> that will talk about baptism into a new life with Christ. Message says it this way. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we were lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. And when we are raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Let's sing our first hymn now. We were baptized in Christ Jesus. This opening prayer taken from parts of the gospel and the epistle readings for today. Thank you, loving spirit, for the warmth of summer and for your invitation to embrace abundant life. Your promise of resurrection allows past troubles to die as we rise with you to new life. Inspire us to follow your lead, even when it requires us to bear a cross of sacrifice in your name. May our love for you be complete as we share words and acts of compassion with a world that yearns for your peace. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. 
I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Epistle reading is Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 1b through 11. What should we say? Should we keep on sinning so that God's wonderful kindness will show up even better? No, we should not. If we are dead to sin, how can we go on sinning? Don't you know that all who share in Christ Jesus by being baptised also share in his death? When we were baptised, we died and were buried with Christ. We were baptised so that we would live a new life as Christ was raised to life by the glory of God the Father. If we shared in Jesus' death by being baptised, we will be raised to life with him. We know that the persons we used to be were nailed to the cross with Jesus. This was done so that our sinful bodies would no longer be the slaves of sin. We know that sin doesn't have power over dead people. As we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that death no longer has any power over Christ. He died and was raised to life never to die again. When Christ died, he died for sin once and for all. But now he is alive and he lives only for God. In the same way, you must think of yourselves as dead to the power of sin. But Christ Jesus has given life to you and you live for God. During the summer, we're going to have a chance to speak aloud again the various affirmations of faith, speaking from our hearts and with our voices, sharing what we believe. This morning's is a modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. This morning's gospel is Matthew 10, verses 24 through 39. No pupil is greater than his teacher. No slave is greater than his master. So a pupil should be satisfied to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If the head of the family is called Beelzebul, the members of the family will be called even worse names. So do not be afraid of people. Whatever is now covered up will be uncovered, and every secret will be made known. What I am telling you in the dark you must repeat in broad daylight, and what you have heard in private you must announce from the housetops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. For only a penny you can buy two sparrows, yet not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So do not be afraid, you are worth much more than many sparrows. 
Those who declare publicly that they belong to me, I will do the same for them before my Father in heaven. But those who reject me publicly, I will reject before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. No, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set sons against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. Your worst enemies will be the members of your own family. Those who love their father or mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who love their son or daughter more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who do not take up their cross and follow in my steps are not fit to be my disciples. Those who try to gain their own life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. You just heard that we are watched more closely than sparrows are watched. We'll sing that now with his eye is on the sparrow. Just oh. 
Good morning. What a messy bunch of readings we have today. I read them the first time each week from a resource called Music and Worship Planner. It's a UMC publication and for each week the four lectionary readings are there using the Common English Version Bible. And this week when I read them, Common English or not, I don't love them. There are nuggets and there are connections, but the stories aren't good ones. They didn't say, talk about that. Not a one of them. We have Abraham kicking Hagar and his first son, Ishmael, to the curb. Sarah has decided, even though the whole thing with Hagar and her son Ishmael was all Sarah's idea, Sarah has decided she's not going to have that child share in Isaac's inheritance, nor is she going to have that boy living near her child, making fun of her child, or taking away from Abraham's affection for her child. The Sarah that we read about last week as laughing about having a son when she's 90 years old has become quite a meanie, jealous, dictatorial, overbearing. What a nice gal. Skip her. Then in Romans, when I read it the second time, thinking that might help me, I used a process that I used when I studied 1 Peter. The person who wrote that study said that we should circle words that repeat, so I did. In the CEB version of Romans 6, 1b through 11, some version of the word sin is used seven times. Some form of death is there 17 times. What a fun couple of topics. Skip. And in Matthew, these are the words that Matthew records that Jesus says to the disciples after he says, I'm sending you out to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is near. He tells these men to heal the sick, raise the dead, cure leprosy, and throw out demons. Imagine, Jesus tells men who have followed along with Jesus and listened to him preach and seen him do these things a few times. And now Jesus says, go out there, men, and go at it. He tells the disciples a lot of happy advice. Don't be afraid. The hairs on your head are numbered. And he says, you are worth more than many sparrows. Those are sort of upside down words to me. Matthew recorded Jesus saying, don't be afraid, even though men will try to kill the body, be glad that they can't kill your soul. Frankly, I don't really relish any part of being killed. I don't like it when my electricity is killed by a storm. I don't function well, even if God knows how many hairs on my head are left or a sparrow is far cheaper than me, and I hear that God cares for them. All of these things are a bit hard for me to talk about. <clears throat> and as if the messiness of the Abraham, Hagar, Sarah triangle wasn't enough mess, Matthew goes on to say, people's enemies are members of their own households. Those who love father or mother more than me aren't worthy of me. Those who love son or daughter more than me aren't worthy of me. Those are hard, hard words to hear and figure out. So. I am glad that I'm not going to. I did a bit of reading and research about all of those readings for today, and for today, I'm not picking any of them. I've decided to spend my time on the psalm for today. Please don't think of it really as me taking the easy road. Think of it as the start of summer vacation. Once a teacher, always a teacher. We teachers are supposed to be on easy street now. I don't want to spend time thinking about sending children into the desert to die or making sense of the messiness of the family relationships that Jesus talked about or that Abraham had in his own little tent town or the number of ways sin and death can be talked about in 11 short verses. I'm taking the Psalm way out. By the way, Psalm 86 is listed as a lament and by definition, I have pretty much lamented for the last 500 words. Apparently, lamenting is good for the soul, and lamenting won't kill off the soul, like Jesus talked about. I will read Psalm 86 in a minute, but I want us to get the full effect of, an, of a lament. So first, a bit of explanation. A psalm of lament, according to Roland Murphy, usually goes this way. First, a cry for help. Then, a description of the psalmist's distress, often mixed with appeals for help. Third, the psalmist might then list reasons why the Lord should help. I guess it's our job to let God know that, right? Fourth, most laments end on a note of certainty, as the psalmist states that he knows the Lord has heard the prayer. And finally, there usually is an ending that includes a promise to keep praising God for the goodness he provides 
especially the deliverance from the trouble that the psalmist is whining uh, or lamenting about. This one, Psalm 86, follows that process. And our psalmist for 86 is David. I am going to read it from the Common English Bible. I encourage you to listen for the parts. Lord, listen closely to me and answer me because I am poor and in need. Guard my life because I'm faithful. Save your servant who trusts in you, you, my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I cry out to you all day long. Make your servant's life happy again because, my Lord, I offer my life to you. Because, my Lord, you are good and forgiving, full of faithful love for all those who cry out to you. Listen closely to my prayer, Lord. Pay close attention to the sound of my requests for mercy. When I am in trouble, I cry out to you because you will answer me. My Lord, there is no one like you among the gods. There's nothing that can compare to your works. All the nations that you've made will come and bow down before you, Lord. They will glorify your name because you are awesome and a wonder worker. You are God, just you. Teach me your way, Lord, so that I can walk in your truth. Make my heart focused only on honoring your name. I give thanks to you, my Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever because your faithful love toward me is awesome and because you've rescued my life from the lowest part of hell. The arrogant rise up against me, God. A gang of violent people want me dead. They don't give a thought for you, but you, my Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy. You are very patient and full of faithful love. Come back to me. Have mercy on me. Give your servant your strength. Save this child of your servant. Show me a sign of your goodness so that those who hate me will see it and be put to shame. Show a sign that you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. One commentary I read said David sort of copied and pasted even before computers and control C and control V to make parts of this psalm. Some of it sounds very familiar. He used parts of other psalms as he wrote this one. And it's clearly a psalm of lament. David's cry for help is listed at the end of the psalm. The arrogant rise up against me, God. A gang of violent people want me dead. Well, that is a problem and clearly a need, which he said right at the start. Lord, listen closely to me and answer me because I am poor and I am in need. So there you have parts one and two of the lament. And the appeals for help are there, clearly. Listen again to the things David wants the Lord to do. Listen, guard, have mercy, make life happy, pay close attention, and answer me. I do have to say here, how many times when you pray, do you say some more things? Listen to me, God. Answer my prayers. Pay attention to these things that I have going on. Make life happy or easier or less full of trouble. And we name a bunch of people who need God's help. We do it all the time. We lament, like David, the man after God's own heart. I think that's a very good thing, that we have very similar thoughts to David's thoughts. Verses 8 through 10 give us a good picture of the God David believes in. He's just like the God we believe in. There is no other God like our God. We believe he is the creator. We think he's awesome and wonderful. The fourth part of lament is a statement of certainty that God will, in fact, help as asked. David says, your faithful love toward me is awesome and you've rescued my life from the lowest part of hell. And finally, David promises to give thanks and to glorify God's name. David promises to do that because he loves God and he knows God is compassionate and merciful, patient and loving him, and God will surely help him and comfort him. Psalm 86 is a lament almost per the recipe perfectly. See how much nicer that is than the family messiness and death and destruction awaiting the disciples? And even though Paul promises that because of Christ's resurrection, none of the sins we commit will leave us in a place of death, it's still nice to be reminded that we can whine and moan to God and things happen in such a way that we can praise him through it and after it. So of course, this whole lament thing brings us to the treasured act of praying. Prayer is a spiritual discipline that is pretty critical if we are to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to speak from the rooftops, as Jesus said to his disciples, as we show what life as a child of God is like. We are expected to speak to God in praise and thanksgiving, to seek Jesus' help daily for the best way of living in honor of him, 
to ask for help in modeling ourselves after Jesus and to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we strive day by day to pick up our crosses and follow Jesus, something the disciples were reminded to do before they left on their mission trips, you know, two by two. And maybe lamenting is a great way to pray. Tell God our needs, that's our cry for help. Describe the distresses and anxiety we have as we appeal for the help only God can give. It's okay to tell God exactly how we feel, why he should help us, how we've been waiting and what we would like him to do. It's also okay to be angry or cry or whine. God knows how you feel anyway. Pray as if your prayers are answers are coming just the way you want them to. Thank God for the answers you pray will come. If you believe that God's ways will be perfect, thank him for that too. Be certain that God hears you regardless of when the answer comes or what that answer is. And finally, praise God for who he is in your life, even in the face of the distress you feel. Praise and worship can happen amidst things that go wrong. Life is messy. There are things to be sad about. There are things that crack our hearts. And there are things for us to lament about. However, there is also abundant evidence that God hears and answers. Just like David said, God listens, answers, answers our prayers, pray, pays attention, and is ready to make life happy. That's what God does. David also named God in verse 8 this, good and forgiving, full of faithful love for all those who cry out to him. Cry out to God, lament to the Lord, Name your need and let him hear you, and then praise and be thankful. Let us pray. Lord, remind us always to come to you in prayer. Remind us to thank you when we do. Remind us to name the ways you are divine and powerful in our lives. Remind us that there is never a time when you are not ready to hear us whine, praise, lament, glorify, moan, sing, wail, and worship. Holy Spirit, fill us with prayer power. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Let us pray. Forgiving and gracious Lord, we come here this day with so many things on our hearts. It's now summer and just like the seasons changing, summer brings transitions as well. Graduations, school vacations that can be wonderful, but also stressful as working families seek care for young children, marriages and family vacations, for others, the transitions may be from healthy living to lives filled with illness and pain. We confess that we haven't always paid attention to these transitions, unaware of the spiritual and emotional adjustments that they require of those in the process. Forgive us when we get so busy with our own lives that we don't take time to reach out to someone who's ill, someone who's mourning the loss of a loved one, someone who feels lost and alone. Remind us again of how Christ offered his whole life that we might live. We pray today for those among us who are dealing with pain and illness, loss and worry, holy and living one, for those we name and the ones whose names we do not know, hear our prayer. We pray with thanksgiving for the joys in our lives, joys that come about by transitions that are fun and expected and bring a, a better life to all. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness in our lives. Help us learn to pray no matter what the circumstances. If we need to lament, give us the words so our cries to you will be heard. You listen to all prayers. Listen now as we pray the prayer your son taught his closest friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus is giving his disciples all kinds of assurance that they will be fine as they travel. This song reminds us of that as well. God will take care of you. Sing along. Be not dismayed, but
today's benediction. God has given you all that you will need as you reach out in love and care to others. Go into God's world bringing the good news of redemption and hope. In Jesus' name, go in peace and may the God of peace go with you always. Amen. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. And may the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong. And may you run and not be weary. May your life be filled with joy. And may the road you travel always lead you home. May you strong.